So Fabio is, uh, is from Italy, he's Italian. He did his uh, PhD in physics in 2014 at the uh, uh, Politecnico uh, de Milano uh, and uh, uh, in the group of uh, Daliera and uh, Carpani um, and uh, and where he did a, a bunch of different things ultrafast wise. He did uh, uh, some time resolved spectroscopy and notably uh, probably one of the very first time resolved ARPA's systems. It must have been at that point. Yeah, the first of Kevin later. Okay, yeah. so a uh, really novel uh, instrumentation. And uh, after his PhD, he came to Canada, uh, where he worked with the Damaskeli Group at, uh, at the Quantum Matter Institute at University of British Columbia from 2015 uh, to 2020, which is when I became familiar uh, with your work and we became uh, uh, introduced. Since um, 2022, you've been officially at INRS? Since 2022. Since officially 2020, yeah. okay. No, really so, so where uh, Fabio is setting up a time resolved ARPES laboratory, not setting up, has set up, yeah, a time resolved ARPES lab, which kind of piggybacks on the advanced laser light source at uh, INRS. Capabilities are amazing, and there's an enormous overlap between sort of your interests and work and the interests and work of people here and elsewhere in the RQMP. So we're really happy that you are also a, an affiliate member of the RQMP or an adjunct. What are we calling them? Associate. Associate. Okay. An associate member of the RQMP, uh, even sort of even being uh, based at IRS. So um, everyone has sat down. Everyone's got their coffee and donuts. Yep. Feel free to take it away. Perfect. So thank you for the introduction. I'm very happy to uh, give this talk here and uh, give you an overview of what uh, we have been doing in the past uh, uh, two, three years at TinyOS, setting up at the time Nano Resolve Automation and Station at the Advanced Laser Light Source User Facility. And uh, also uh, later on in my talk, I want to discuss about recent uh, Recent inelastic distance scattering uh, uh, measurements, where we established the presence of uh, quasi circular dynamic correlation with the charge order wave vector in the conductor. So, um, again, in my presentation at the beginning, I'm going to focus on uh, time resolve automation. I'm going to give you an introduction to uh, angular resolve automation spectroscopy, time resolve access, show the capabilities of our new end station. Show some preliminary results, and then I'm moving towards bricks. We had a similar problem last week. Yeah, it worked halfway through. Oh, here here it is. Beautiful. I don't think anyone saw. It. So, angular photomission. Angular photomission is a photonic and electronic technique that uh, provides direct access to the electronic dispersion of uh, solids. Materials. So here is a classic example uh, taking a, a topological oscillator with a topological surface state. Of course, in equilibrium, we unoccupied states are not uh, occupied, right? So I have uh, a category familiarity given by familiar distribution. And what happens is that, well, when I shine some light and uh, I remove my electron, I can detect the angle of emission of these electrons. In addition to the kinetic energy of this electron and applying energy and momentum conservation laws, I can directly relate the angle of emission and the kinetic energy to the binding energy and the crystal momentum of the electron inside the material. Now, photomission has been around for a pretty long time, and uh, we've seen uh, a clear development in uh, the technique in the past uh, 50 years. Uh, as you can see here, if you just look at the energy resolution, we pass from EV energy resolution to sub milliv at the moment. And currently, well, something happened uh, in the early 90s. Uh, well, thanks to the discovery of foot rates, uh, clearly, the number of applications in foot emission were uh, clearly to a spike, and then it's still con constantly growing. But all this was uh, given by foot rates to the conductor that pushed really all the artist community to improve, improve, improve the, the technique indeed that now achieving mini the end resolution. Now, um, of course, what we can do is 
to extend the upper CNA into the tender main, taking advantage of ultra fast lasers and uh, pump probe uh, technique. So, in particular, what you can do is to add uh, a pump pulse, in this case, a visible infrared that can, be, can range from terahertz to potentially ultraviolet, and we couple it to probe pulse. So, the probe pulse is for the internet, and the pump is spread through the own system. So if you look again at the example we shown before, when we discussed about equilibrium markers, in this case, now I have uh, two pulses, a probe pulse and a pump pulse. If the probe pulse arrives before the pump pulse, of course, the probe doesn't see any effect of the pump pulse. But as soon as the pump photosets electrons above the formula, I can map an occupied state. And of course, if I change the time delay between pump and probe, I can try ultra fast electron dynamics in the material. Now, uh, again, uh, time resolved emission is a pretty novel uh, technique that has been developed in the past uh, 30 years. And normally, let's say in the past 10, 15 years, we witnessed an increase of the number of publications. But you know, if you compare to conventional articles, right, we're talking about 1,000 publications per year. Here, we are still around 40 publications per, per year, still rising. But so far, anyway, uh, we already applied the technique on several quantum materials. And here I'm providing some examples, ranging from uh, uh, topology insulator, so mapping the topology of the state of topology insulator, superconductor, tracking the ultra fast response of a superconducting gap with a K resolution, excitonic insulator, transition method decalcogen, in this particular case, is written in this recent national paper, you see the emergence of interlayer exciton with momentum and resolution, or charge order system. Now, in the past uh, two, three years, uh, we work hard to provide a, a review on the technique that is going to appear on the review model physics, uh, hopefully early 2024. And uh, well, owing to all this extensive work, I would like to give you in the next few slides just an introduction of what we can learn with Tamerson, APES technique, apply on several different materials. So in particular, I would say that there are five potential approaches, five experimental strategies for timer solve artists. The first one is simply mapping an occupied state, right? Where, as I said before, photomission, commercial photomission, we are limited to occupied states, right? We cannot see above the familiar. Well, indeed, timer solve photomission has been applied to transition metallic coordinates, mapping the, the gap, right? To imbalance and production band. These are earlier work in 2015, and you see how we also improve from point of view of the data quality. You can see the top of the balance band, the bottom of the production band, eventually as a function of the energy, right? So we can really map all, all where carriers, photosynthetic carriers are redistributed in momentum space. Uh, I already discussed the emergence of excitons, I already discussed interstitial metallic coordinates, discussed the feeling of the topological surface state in a topological insulator, to dimensional topological insulator. And very recently, well, the community is really trying to push on, on imaging the appearance of uh, flocket block states. So in particular, flock engineering. So using time-dependent or time-periodic perturbations to replicate the mechanical structure in energy. And in this particular case, early to 2023 on black fossils, they demonstrated the engineering of the balance band of black fossils by changing the pump wavelength, the pump photon, photon energy, and sort of crossing the top of the balance band and then inducing the emergence of a nipletization gap. So you can really modify the electronic structure upon a periodic perturbation time via block engineering. Now, of course, in our class of studies, performer with uh, timers of Arpes is uh, the study of photo use phase transition. And here I'm presenting uh, some uh, examples. For instance, uh, the work on uh, uh, three tellurides, a classic material where you observe uh, a long range charge order. You can pump the system, you can melt the charge order gap. This is the case. So what you see here is that this image is very nice. Momentum, energy before the pump, Charge on the gap, you pump, you populate above the gap, but you can still see the gap. And then after, after some time, you see that, uh, well, the gap gets filled. So you clearly see all the evolution of the, of the charge on the gap. Uh, 
meta to insulate the transition. In this case, it was the indium, uh, indium chain on the silicon 111. And also, in this case, the pump system was the insulator, the pump induced a structural, uh, sorry, a, a light induced modification of the uh, surface reconstruction and inducing the material to transition from uh, insulator to, man, to metallic. Exit on insulator, and of course, superconducting. In this case, right again, as I showed before, the filling of a superconducting gap pump on pump acetation on ultra pass and scale of incorporated superconducting. Another approach, another um, capability of Tanner Sobarpes is to extract the electron photon cap. Now, here I show you five different experimental strategies to extract electron photon capping via time of markers. So the first one, proposed almost 15 years ago by Luca Perpetti, according to Arthur former co in this case, in, uh, on the compressive superconductor along with another direction, was the multi-temperature model. So you pump a system, you deposit energy to your electronic bar, and then you look how this energy is relaxing back. So it's transferred to the phononic bar and to the lattice. And by starting the time scale of this relaxation, you can sort of infer in a qualitative way the coupling constant. Of course, while well, we develop our other potential methods, uh, the first one is we have direct access to the uh, one electron removal spectral function that can be written in terms of the electron self energy that takes into account all many body interaction. So we can uh, track how the electronic band dispersion and the line shape or the line shape of our uh, of our upper image changes our compensation. So extract the temporal evolution of the self energy. We propose again. This was a work in uh, uh, Damascheli's group at the UPC. We propose to pump for the site carries in specific K state and look at the quantized decay, the emission of specific form, and by starting the time scale, this case was the case of graphene and the sketch, so graphene before, before pump, uh, before pump acetation, you start with a specific wavelength, you create a direct population peak, so you just place electron in a specific K state, and then you look at how these electrons decay by emission of a single form. And we are able to indeed extract this decay and extract in a quantitative way the electron cost. And of course, there are other methods, for instance, frequency domain address, where you see how each band is coupling to specific phonons at different frequency, or let you use coherent phonons. And in this case, you use a coherent phonon and you look at how the electronic band structure is oscillating. And that gives you information, direct information about the Displacement, uh, the displacement uh, potential and for the capital cost. Oh, sorry. I want to mention uh, the last two, let's say, uh, post potential approaches. The first one is the can creation you, of this. Can the previous slide? Yep. When you measure a couple of constants, yep. do you get it by two different methods? Do you get the same coupling? Because in the upper method, it's a two temperature model yep. with a bit parameter, and the lower one, you probably measure the frequency modulation amplitude, right? So this never gives you the right constant. So that's a big lack completely. That is a qualitative estimate of the time scale and qualitative uh, estimate of the order of magnitude. But this doesn't work. Absolutely doesn't work. Unless uh, you are in the specific case of a coupling to a specific mode and the full control on this the scattering phase space of your letter. In this case, you can induce a coherent form that is coupling to a specific electronic band. So here you can just look at a specific band, a specific K, how is oscillating. In this work, yeah, 2017, they combine timers of arcs where they take the oscillation of electronic band structure and they combine timers of X-ray diffraction. So they knew how much right, our atomic species were moving. So what was the, the, display, the, the, the displacement, right? In the real space. Uh, and that matters, matters, your photon energy, right? Where you're exciting? Uh, in this case, in this case, it's not resonant. So in this case, it's just, no, 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 this was not. This was not 1.5 B. So you just uh, excite out of plane A1G phonons. Yeah. 
So it, it sort of does not really depend on photon energy. <laughs> you can have cases where you are where you're coupling to infrared active uh, photons, but it would be very nice uh, to do, or you know, in uh, other methods as well. Eventually, you can use a photon that uh, where you really need a, a specific wavelength with that specific photon, and then you call the atomic structure. <laughs> For instance, here one of the big problems in all these measurements is that. This is the evolution of the graph peak, right? And you always see that there is a coherent oscillation, but in addition to that, you have also this smooth background, right? You might be using coherent phonons, you can have a background. So the sort of shift that you see in this case, we're just focusing on the coherent part, not all the additional shift. Can I ask? Yes, you're already answering. Yes. So for the picture on the right, yeah. uh, how do you place an electron in that particular energy and why this energy? And also when it decays, how is the photon and the phonon energy um, uh, chosen, right? Because there's no momentum. So in this particular case, so uh, we did this work on graphite, but we can imagine this sort of model that was done uh, on, uh, on graphene. The idea is that uh, in graphene, right, if you have a direct cone and you pump it, there is only one allowed transition, vertical transition. So you go from below to above, right? This is a, a vertical transition. So you know exactly where you are locating your uh -huh. electron at time zero. Okay. Then the point that uh, to identify this phonon-induced replica, what we call here a, a PIR, what we did was eventually map the appearance of this direct uh, uh, transition population, this DTP, or this direct transition peak. And then see the appearance of these additional peaks and check the energy, right? The energy difference from the direct transition peak. And eventually you realize that you can do a calculation, you can realize that in, in uh, graphene also has branded with uh, ultrafast electron diffuse scattering, there is a very strong coupling to the K uh, optical phonon. Mm -hmm with an energy of around 200 mV, and indeed we saw this replica at 200 mV. And does the, the momentum is also lost in the process? The it? momentum in this case, well, it's not lost, but in our case, right, this is a K phonon, right? It's connecting one direct cone to another direct cone. Ah, okay. So of course, then uh, we see all potential replicas. So we just focus on one direct cone, but the reality, the electron that we see below is coming from another direct cone via scattering off of a phonon. Okay. We don't have specific momentum or Q resolution in this case, or right? But knowing what phonons are available in graphite, we are able to identify a specific phonon that was cutting off. Okay. Oh, uh, but you have the momentum here, right? Even well, this moment, but this is scale, right? So we know the nice thing is that this is a, we have started remote projected electron phonon scattering, but because we co-locate so electron as a specific case state, and we look at the K state where they're scattering off. But in principle, we don't know what Q, what modes Q are scattering off our electrons. So we have K resolution, but not Q resolution. To do that, one, we need to extend the arc technique to go beyond the conventional one electron removal uh, uh, spectral function. So every time we're at, we this before, every time that you, you do, uh, you perform arcs, eventually you are probably just uh, a coupon prop propagator, right? A G11 prime, right? This means that all many body renormalization are average over all potential Q and K state. Mm -hmm. There could be possibilities to go beyond even foot emission. So to a certain four point propagator. Mm -hmm. And that, in that case, you would have access also to Q. Mm -hmm. but, Maybe it's yeah. kind of answering that, but uh, so this is going to be a rate of this electrons, right? Not and, then, and then don't they care about the, because you're dealing with unit cell level phonons, uh, optical phonons. So presumably in certain directions, the second peak is stronger. Yeah. Whereas in other directions, it's not as strong. Do you, yeah. you see that? Yeah, the reality is not ringer. We saw that in the part we have calculation by less camper, uh -huh. where indeed the uh, VG, uh, so the electron phonomatic segment, you can calculate VG as a function of the K initial, K final. And what you realize is that the scattering is not uniform. Okay. So you would have a sort of an enhanced scattering on the side, on one side of the point. Okay. Yeah. So it's not perfectly uniform. Yes. And it reflects the symmetries of the 
uh, of the underlying molecular. I mean, uh, you reflect the you, you reflect eventually the strengths of the of the of the of the molecular okay. element. Okay. And but of course, there are some symmetry considerations. Right. Okay, so very briefly here, what I, what I wanted to say is that uh, sometimes, mainly when you pump a semiconductor, you could induce uh, surface photo water. Simply, you pump the system and uh, you just create some hole, and the hole just reached inside the material while the electrons stay in the surface. So, this creates a surface photo voltage, so a surface electric field. And that, uh, most of the time, uh, well, it's sort of affecting our measurements, it's going to neglect it, but sometimes can be used for very nice application. This was an example. So. Again, in UBC, we uh, engineered, we deposited uh, alkaline methods on the surface of uh, topological solution. So we created these two-dimensional electron gases split by uh, um, rather splitting. So it's rather splitting. And you see two layers, like two quantum wells. So the first one, we clear splitting, and the second one, where we don't, where we cannot really restore the splitting. And when you pump, not going too much into detail, but you see here in the differential image, the differential image is uh, Positive pump of delay minus negative pump of delay, so enhance the changes out of pump excitation. You see that all these quantum wave states are shifting down. And in addition, you can also start that the Biasma split things change simply, simply because you pump, you induce the surface photo water, so the surface photo water, you change the potential of the surface, the gradient of the potential of the surface. So this means that you change the potential well, you change the position. Of a quantum well, you change the Rasmus split. So you can take advantage of also, right, of changing the gradient of the potential of the surface to modify the spin trouble, the spin properties in this case of the material, in this case of the two-dimensional two mass. That looks like something interesting as a feature a spectroscopist I hear, one spectroscopist to another. So if you look at your first image, yeah. then you look at the upper curve, the second curve, it looks like there is a splitting. Yeah, this is Rasmus splitting. Uh, maybe the, 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 the okay, the very thin line versus the thick line. Yeah, these two. Yeah. So this is a, a parabola. Yeah. But due to the strong spin of the coupling and the breaking uh, the direction, see the crossing there. You have a Rasmus splitting, and this split and instead of having a Zima splitting, but you have a splitting in, in energy. This yeah. is a splitting in momentum. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Rasmus splitting. But the nice thing, and this depends on the gradient of the, the gradient of the potential of the surface. So when you pump and you create a transit electric field of the surface, you modify the potential, and eventually you modify the splitting. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. So, so this relates to an earlier question. What, what about the you talked about the electron phonon coupling matrix elements, but what about the photo emission matrix element? So, so you've got two parabolas there, right? Yeah. Which are seem yeah. to be split in K positive and K negative. Yeah. But the the on the one hand side the Right hand curve is darker, and on the left hand side, the other curve is darker. Yep. So, uh, this is a really photomicromatic element. And uh, in this particular study, we didn't pay too much attention on verifying whether photomicromatic element were changing. But potentially, also, every time that you pump, the matrix element may change. We need to be extremely careful. Uh, you can imagine, indeed, uh, Right, the matrix element is just you know initial state uh, connected to final state by a little um, interaction with Tonya, right? But the point is that the matrix element depends on the symmetry of the initial state. If for some reason you pump the system, you induce a photon, for instance, you might modify, you may modify the wave function of the initial state. Matrix element, the matrix element changes. We have some works where we demonstrate that this may happen in a mainly in multi-balanced systems or in systems where the initial state is described by a linear combination of atomic orbitals, for instance. Yeah. In topological instrumental, that happens. Yeah. So the stuff on the surface, why? I mean, you're saying that you create a uh, small voltage difference on yeah. the surface, which gives rise to a large bus from orbit. But uh, it's not oscillating? Or, I mean, what, it's just like roughly, so I'm a little bit confused, but what is the... So what happens, what happens in the following? Already before the pump dissipation, right? Yeah. So here we have, uh, you can consider topology of the as a simple data, right? So you have band bending, right? Imagine you have band bending. The band bending, so it means that you have a potential well. So if you add some electrons, if you deposit some uh, alkali metals, you donate electrons. So these electrons fill the surface and fill the potential well. 
but is the, the power of the, the particle in the box, eventually all the levels are quantized. So you have a period of quantized energy level, this quantum level. In addition to that, topology oscillator have a very strong, uh, have a strong spinomial coupling. So this means that uh, strong spinomial coupling, in addition to the gradient of the breaking of the inversion symmetry, gives rise to Rasmus splitting. Right. The other thing that I'm doing here is to part the system. I leave some walls in the box so far away from the surface and move more electrons to the surface. So the okay. two are separated spatially. Okay. So this surface photovoltage lasts for even nanoseconds. Is a sort of a constant electric field that, that I'm adding, changing the bending of the potential, the bend bending. Eventually, I'm okay. modifying the bend bending via surface photovoltage. Okay? okay. And also, <laughs> if you have an electric field on the surface and you're extracting an electron, and then you're measuring the energy of that electron, shouldn't that also change the energy of the electron? Yes. In fact, we have to correct. Okay, okay. so you give that. All this is correct. All this data, we have to, when you pump it, all this shit up and that. But it's a, so it's, 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 it's a good point. You're right. Yeah. Every time you have a surface with all the energy, you shift up and down. And that is a way to see if there is a surface photo on the channel. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I forgot. Well, we can also start uh, information about uh, uh, magnetic material. For instance, this was in nickel. You can uh, track how the strain splitting changing up, up on public station, all the business of ultra fast demagnetization, for instance. You can directly track it more into resolution, how this change is changing. Or we do very complex experiments that are time, resolve, spin, resolve arcs where you can, in this case, this was one of the first work by done by Lanzar's group, where they found the system, they populated the topological surface state, but also a super exponential state. And this was a spin resolved artist where we did the image a spinularization of the surface resonance state. Okay. We said this was a general introduction to what we can learn. Yeah, timers of up as technique, we're still learning a lot. The, the signal is extremely complicated, right? Most of the time, it's extremely difficult to, to disentangle all different contributions. But now I want to present well, the current system we have at uh, ARS, at IRS. So what we have, uh, we have, uh, at the moment, we're using tangling by, uh, by amplitude, so 50 baht, uh, Ethereum waves, and probably 50 kilohertz. And uh, at, the moment, at the moment, we're using 60 bit to 40 minute power electron, the fifth thermoids of our fundamental. And we have uh, an OPA, three stage OPA plus DFG on build to generate the medium for the light. Um, this is the current state of the system. I need to launch, of course, all my PhD students and uh, the other staff that is working to this project. And in particular, I have a strong collaboration with Francois Legare, previous director of us, now director of the ENRS EMT Center. And a few days ago, was uh, Ali Brahim, a research associate, was appointed as director. Okay, so just to demonstrate what are uh, uh, our capability, so our OPA plus DFG, uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, the signal and the other we can generate, so from 1.4 to 0.8 micron for the signal, 2.3 to 3 micron for the other, and here we're talking about the, you know, we have a power at 150 kilohertz from 4 to 2 watt at the sample. Uh, for the DFG, we can generate for 4 micron, so 300 mV to 8 micron. Uh, 150 mV uh, with a pump on the power from 300 mV, but uh, down to 150, 120 mV. So it's more than enough, really, to pump, blast our sample. Um, we're still optimizing, but uh, OPA is working pretty well. We have a pretty 2% uh, RMS over 24 hours. So it's working. Oh, yep. uh, what's, a, what's a pump spot size? Yeah, I guess I need the pump response size, we can go down to 200 micron. 200 micron. It, it, it depends. If you have four micron, easy, easily we can go 150. But of course, it gets a bit more challenging when you go to eight micron. In reality, I'm not going to We are planning also to go to terahertz. Yeah. All the system has been designed to host an off axis, but not in the so <laughs> Yeah, but this, <laughs> the next, uh, the next uh, from five to twenty years we go to that. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> uh, so, just to demonstrate the capabilities of our system, we have uh, a next generation hemispherical analyzer. Why call it the next generation? Because what we can do is we can put an interleton, we can detect an electron 
within a system, system degree code of emission without moving the sample. So these are raw data of a topology oscillator. This was part of right? it. energy, angle of emission. But this is what we can directly measure without moving the sample. Seriously. Plus minus 30, plus minus 30. We have a full cone of 60 degree without moving the sample. Previous hemispheric analyzer with the flat of technology were limited to plus minus 10. So now we have plus minus 60. It's worked pretty well. But this is the first one. We are, you know, we are collaborating with specs to make it work. It was a prototype, now we're selling it. So some problems, but uh, it's working pretty well. And this is an example of our data. Uh, so eventually, thanks to these capabilities, all the time that we measure, we have a four-dimensional data set. So uh, we have our intensity, function kx, ky, and, and delay. So right. The, and this is uh, just an example on a uh, bismuth parallel topology. Right? Of course, every time that you talk about thermal solar, there's two important working parameters are energy and thermal resolution. So uh, we can uh, go down right here, the APV, but uh, so we check our energy resolution of the surface state of 111, and uh, we measure down to 7 mV energy resolution. When we measure with 7 mV, we have a temporary solution of 400, 350 femtoseconds because we need to change the VBO crystal depending on the variation between temporal and, uh, and energy resolution. But if you use a video crystal that gives us 15 million energy resolution. We have a temporal resolution of around 175 femtoseconds. So, depending on your experiment, we can change it, the video. But of course, we're not stopping here because what we're doing, the plan is to go to high harmonics. So, tunable high harmonics with tunable linear polarization from around 10 to 40V. We already installed a Monochromator beamline. This is a time preserved monochromator with a higher chamber generation time preserved monochromator. Monochromator time preserved monochromator means that we use just single grid instead of two grid. It's enough for us uh, to maintain a pass duration under, under 100 femtoseconds. And then we have a refocusing system. So in the near future, we're going to have also high harmonics on the sample with our pump, with our MIDI for the pump. And this is in collaboration with Luca Poletto and the Fabio Passetto. In Italy at uh, uh, Padua. I want to advertise the fact that we are a user facility. We are an MSI user facility. So you can apply for beam time. The next call for proposal, cycle two, uh, the deadline is at December 4th. So if you have any potential experiments you would like to, to propose, not only for the after end station, but also for all other end station paths, you can contact me or you can contact uh, Francois Ligari or other people at us. Please, uh, we will be very happy to welcome you to use our system. Even though the artist is still on a sort of commissioning, but we're still producing reasonable data, as I'm going to show you later. So the first step, the, one of the first uh, uh, measurements that we performed was, of course, on cuprates. I've been working on cuprates for several years, and uh, cuprates always gives uh, great data. So the first thing I wanted to do is that, well, at UBC, when I was down to 1.5 degree, I observed the feeling of a superconducting gap due to the light use uh, uh, enhancement of the fluctuation. So I thought, well, what happens if I pump with mid infrared? So in order of money to do that, lower, well, it's, it's exactly the same. So pumping with uh, 0.15 or 1.5 doesn't change anything. We still need to analyze data, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, you see exactly the same feeling dynamics, exactly the same dynamics as well. Eventually, we're pumping through the transparency window of cuprates. Something will change if we pump below 80 millibar, where we can excite the phonon, or above 2 mb across the chart transfer gap. So this is the reason. Uh, another thing that I'm doing with uh, my PhD uh, student here, Dario, is uh, we're looking at the uh, ultrafast evolution of the hybridization between the main band and the superstructure replica. So what I'm showing here is a framing surface map along gamma x direction of disco 212, so superconductor. What happens in uh, disco, this moon based plate, there is a superstructure along one dimension, along a diagonal, copper in diagonal. So what happens is that the main band that will be leaves hybridize with a replica band. Well, what it turns out, and this has been observed a few years ago, what turns out is that here we are hybridizing Two bands where the superconducting gap is opposite sign. 
And what is curious is that the hybridization gap opens only when the superconducting gap has opposite sign. So what we're investigating is to pump the system, induce phase fluctuation, and see at this point in this, we can see hybridization gap, how really phase fluctuation are evolving. This is a project. The second project uh, is really this system, uh, we want to take advantage of this system with these medium infrared pump capabilities to explore flow changes. Now, it's extremely difficult, requires a superior stability of all the systems, starting from the laser to the system to the car side. But we, still, we already have a reasonable uh, preliminary results. This is a bismol terrorite pump with 8 micro, 150 mm thermic surface of bismol terrorite, where we see topological surface state and then the balance band. And here, on um, two direction, gamma K, gamma N, you see, well, put here just a dashed line. But I don't know if you really see, but we see the emergence of replica. I think it's very clear in this Fermi surface map where not only you see the main bed, but you see all this shadow on the side. All the shadow on the side are replica. So we we started to image Rep the replica bands in energy. <laughs> so I want to just to uh, flash some of the recent results I did with uh, my collaborators uh, looking at uh, uh, positive super dynamic correlation in the plates. So my key collaborators are Eduardo Serenito Yale, Alex Farnes in San Diego, and Les Camper from uh, uh, North Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina City University. <coughs> and this, you know, we did several experiments at three different beam lines. So this was a really an extensive, uh, uh, well, experimental campaigns over the past several years. So we use the uh, RICS technique. This uh, technique is a photon in, photon out technique, but not only we look at the scatter beam and we just integrate the energy, but we use also a spectrometer to separate all the colors in the scatter beam. So doing that, it's very similar to Raman, we can extract the Q dependence, momentum dependence of our, of the collective excitation inside our material. So we can extract the Q, the dispersion of manons, phonons, and of course, other potential other electronic uh, excitation. Now we focus on charge order. The charge order is a, a separate organization of the charge that breaks or differs from the uh, lattice periodicity. And the key aspect of charge order is, is that uh, it's been demonstrated in the past few years that charge order is not simply an elastic, it's not simply static, but it's dynamic. And this has been shown by several works where we saw that the charge order peak is not really a zero. So very low energy dynamic correlation, but also high energy in our operation. This is why we see all interview base, disco base, electron base, mercury base operation. So also in all operation, we see that the charge order is not only static. The point is that all these measurements have been done along the crystallographic axis, or along the main crystallographic axis, or 45 degree. Nothing is connecting the middle. So what we did, this was a previous work that uh, started everything. Uh, what we demonstrated is that uh, in BISCO, uh, charge order, we can observe the presence of charge order peak. This is symmetry, but we have a QX, QY, so we have conventional charge order peak along the crystallographic axis, but they are connected by a sort of very broad dynamic charge correlation. And in this initial work, the energy solution was not great, so we say, okay, this dynamic charge correlation stays in the medium for the region, but we don't really know what is the energy scale. So what we did, we wanted to verify whether this dynamic charge correlation were present also at low energy. Why? Because imagine to have charge correlations in the 70, 80 milli energy range, beta isotropic. That could give you scattering, or a scattering channel we could describe, for instance, the strange metal behavior of operates, margin of, margin of family liquid behavior. And this indeed has been proposed. And the point is that in our, our, our problem was, can we really demonstrate whether this dynamic charge correlation are present at low energy? Well, yes, we did it with a great, we proved energy resolution from 800 to 37 mV. And the trick that we used was the following. The trick is the following. So these are two conventional risk spectra measure at specific uh, azimuthal direction. So one is along axis and one 30 degree off, a specific Q. 
This is just to give you an example. So we can fit very well this data. Elastic peak, phone on peak, phone on 70 mb. There is another peak here, which is a two phone. Uh, uh, Paramanon, so magnetic acetation, uh, electron will continue. Now, I can add another 50 parameter, but there are already 15 parameters. I can fit whatever I want here, right? So adding a 15 parameter doesn't work in this case. In addition, I want to flash very briefly. Uh, so for this additional peak, we recently demonstrated that this is a, a two-photon two process. In order to do that, we did polarimetric rings, even more complicated. That took forever. Each, uh, each match takes, uh, each scan takes one day. But the idea is that you can separate, uh, it's a bit like Raman where you separate the polarization. So if you measure something in sigma, sigma, so the polarization doesn't rotate this charge. The sigma pi is a spin flip transition, so it's magnetic. In this case, we notice that this peak is in the charge cha in the charge channel, so it's a phone. Luckily, it's a, it's a two phone process. It's just a, to highlight this recent work. But eventually, what we did was the following: Let's use the phonon dispersion to map dynamic charge correlation. So every time, right, it's been demonstrated on the crystallography axis. When when you have charge over, you see a soft in it. In this case, we are looking at the bone stretching board at 70 mV. So this was measured, and we saw indeed that uh, they demonstrated that the dynamic charge fluctuation affects the dispersion of the of the of the of the bone stretching mode. So what we did was to focus on the bone stretching mode, also because it's extremely weakly dispersing. So we can use that, we can use this, uh, it as a base. And these are our data. So we started along the axis. Okay, well, we see the we see the soft thing. We go along the diagonal. Well, okay, this is our baseline. And then these are other cats. We see the soft thing along almost all our two dimensional uh, space. More or less the same cubetto. So we can map and we can find that the charge order correlations or quasi silver dynamic correlations are also present in the low energy scale. And therefore, probably are really affecting the properties of brains and other potential materials, the normal state properties. Right? This could be a source for strange metal behavior. And this was, but uh, if you want to finish, just one additional slide. So again, I want to highlight the system that we had, uh, that we had at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, INRS, at the AS laboratory. This is in very few modern physics, we, we, we propose five new frontiers of the technique. In our case, my lab, we're focusing mainly on sub-cycle, non-wave and public citation. And also, really, what I would like to go for is to extract the dynamical correlation. So this is what we were discussing before. So go beyond the two-point propagator to the four-point propagator. And there are, if you're interested, we can discuss about it now. Uh, and again, if you're interested, apply by the center point. And thank you for your attention. Great, right. talk. That was really great. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Can you put the previous slide in the last slide you had with that on? Uh, this, yeah. this one? No, no, no. no. This one. This one, yeah. So I guess I'm sitting quite far back in that sense, but does the diffuse ring, the new data you got, does that have three sub rings in it? No, no, no. The, 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 this was uh, this was a uh, extensive movement, and that is that was from this data was not great. The resolution was a ton of millimeter. So this is really this is why eventually we have to move to higher resolution of X. No, this is a full ring. The nice thing is that in the supplementary of this work, we also repeated the same measurements. We did the dot independence, and we see that these rings. Uh, displays a dot independence and follow the dot independence of the solve the charge order. So the cube atom charge order as a sort of linear dependence of the dot in a certain region. And we see exactly the same most of the in. So all this data were was repeated and verified. But we are looking at uh, so I think that here eventually, you know, in this one, eventually the charge order is extremely broad. We are talking about uh, uh, correlation lengths of the order of three, four unit cells. They stop charge order. Right, so I'm not sure I quite understand. So, or, so if I look at the not that not spot between the two spots, 
the, the, the broad. This book, right? There, I can, I can see three maps or three. No, yeah, but, 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 that, is a, that is an artist, that is not here. Where is that on? That is, a, that is just the, done by interpolation because we have to pass through oh. a, okay. a uh, sort of, uh, we have to apply Voronoi interpolation to go on polar, right? It's an interpolation, it's not good. Are there any questions from the online folks? So, all right. So, Absolutely understand if you have an exciton, you might have an energy shift. But uh, if the energy shifts are sort of inside your ability to resolve, is, are there other, just thinking about sort of these higher order correlations that you might be talking about? So is there, what what other smoking guns for correlated electron hole behavior is there in, a, in our best spectrum? Is there any? Or? In principle, yes. In principle, um, and that was also a point of this recent paper. In principle, the presence of an exciton should also uh, lead to a renormalization of band structure. Uh, the point is that uh, it's always very difficult to map that because every time that you pump, you always see your band structure get renormalized. Always. There is no other time of persistence where you don't detect a small shift. So, is it because you're in, you're launching a phonon, you're inferring a phonon, you have uh, just even increase of electronic temperature, that's actually liquid, it's going to change the, the real part of the surprise. Everything is going to shift. So, yes, there should be additional indicators, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not so easy. Uh, so far, at least in TMDs, you know, in TMDs where the bonding energy is over order of 100 mV, you clearly see these excitonic like, feet. Sure, well separated from the bottom of the notion of that is reasonable. In addition, the excitonic feature should map the dissociation, should mimic the dispersion of the balance band, not of the conduction band. So this means that this has been demonstrated in KMD by cameras of Arthas, but you indeed the excitonic feature as an opposite uh, concavity work to the one that you band. If you do that, then Clear. Um, it's, it's pretty clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You some very general yes. this question. That's nothing to do with the yeah. result. Oh, I've always thought or had to learn that thing a long time ago. So that it really only works for the truly sound things. For the mission? No, no part is part of the mission. Part is this thing. Is that still true, or is this not just approximation? It's an approximation. Uh, just, just, just to give you. Uh, an example. Of course, we are surface sensitive, but most of the time you need to be a semi careful uh, to disentangle surface contribution from uh, bulk contribution. But we can do that. The first uh, example is that you can do a photon energy dependence. And if a feature that you see is, uh, is dispersing its bulk, and most of the time we see bulk feature. Of course, if you increase the photon energy, you're more soft, say, Arcus is eventually more sensitive to bulk. This said, uh, you know, when I was showing cuprates, right? Cuprates have uh, a C axis of 30 Armstrong. Okay. The copper oxygen plane is 15 Armstrong below the surface. I, I measure it. And in addition, I see the superstructure replica that are given by a sort of stacking fault of this unicell that are gigantic of 30, 30 Armstrong. So you, you, you broke the bike. You probe efforts of the bug. So I can get a three-dimensional <laughs> structure or just a two-dimensional surface and structure. No, no, we measure, we measure the we measure the three-dimensional. In fact, most of the time when you see bug states, of course, if you have surface state, it's very sharp. But when you measure bug states, you always see that they're pretty broad. That is usually referred to as uh, KZ broadening, because you are probing different KZ. And then what you can do is that you change the photon energy, and then you change the, the KZ. This is also why at NRS I want to have high harmonics. Because tunable from 10 to 40 V, because depending on the material I want to study, I want to select the right KZ, for instance. Yeah. So maybe even proper. So the excitement you observe, does it is, is this a spin singer or does it spin star? For the topological axis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think I observe a topological axis. No. I don't think it's a topological axis. I think it's just accumulation of carriers at the bottom of the measurement. If you measure to measure gallium arsenide, 
e o pá, e o Leva com o Leixo nas botas, e o Serinho, e o Leva com o Leixo nas botas, for o Nano Seconds. A Belida diz isso outro dia. So, the thing is that if you look at the spin in this or art, that's that will be seen. If you get a like this, then not a spin thing. Yeah, but what is the problem with that? There is an intrinsic problem with that. That the topology of a state is hybridized with the conduction band. The topology of a state itself is uh, is uh, as a, as a spin polarization. So you're going to always measure spin polarization independently. The spin polarization is going to be always there. If it is an exit or not. So that, that was also it's great. The experiment is extremely difficult to determine so spin so lattice, but I don't think that the, this. Specific case is uh, demonstrates that this is an accident. Tammy is the last question. <laughs> we have lunch. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, to distinguish between an exciton and a, a premolation, can't you just follow it in time and see the relaxation time? Isn't but, it different? The, 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 this is this is what we're trying to do. Okay. Uh, but and. Is still uh, unclear. The idea is the following. So we're going to do the experiment, and the point is the following. Let me let me let me put it this way. So many people have measured this motel rate in the past ten years. No one has really observed this feature before. Why? Because. Uh, in the past, we're mainly using titanium sapphire laser. What does it mean? Bear with me. The, fu the fundamental was 1.5 EV, so we're generating the fourth harmonic. So we are using 6.2 EV to emit our letter. Okay. In this case, we use 6 EV, the same photon energy used for the natural. I know that sounds a very small variation, 0.2 EV, but that changes the KZ. So what I believe that is happening here is that. Uh, a 6.2, uh, sorry, a 6 EV, we are exactly a gamma point where you have the minimum of the conduction band. If you go slightly a different KZ, we're not going to have any more of the minimum of the conduction band. So we're not going to see this accumulation. Mm -hmm. And that is what I want to, to, to do for, uh, for demonstrating that this is accumulation mm -hmm. uh, instead of, uh, instead of uh, topology. If we go at 6.2 and I still see this, well, maybe it's an exit. I cannot really, I cannot really doubt at the moment. I will just mention that there is an open slot at 3 p.m. Uh, anybody sort of wanted to get on the schedule. And so with that, we should thank Fabio. Thank you.